Welcome back to Black News Tonight. Yvette Carnell, the president of American Descendants of Slavery Advocacy Foundation, will discuss her organization's take on the payment due to black Americans for over a century and a half. Uh, so much to be said about this idea of reparations. And it really comes down in many ways to whether you think black folk deserve to have the damage done repaired. And there are many people at the forefront of this movement, but there's probably no movement more powerful, more vocal, and more influential in the conversation about uh, reparations in the United States than that of ADOS. It's controversial, it's uh, debated, it's contested, but it's absolutely one of the most important organizations going on. And so we wanted to have one of the founders of the organization, Yvette Carnell, join us here on Black News uh, tonight. Yvette, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Mark. I appreciate it. Talk to me, first of all, about the current reparation policy proposals that are on the table. We see local, locally based things like in Evanston, uh, Illinois. We see uh, conversations about broader proposals. What, what's your sense of what, what the current policy landscape is? Well, I see Evanston actually as a problem because what you see is that there was a, there were money suggested for reparations, um, like 250k. But that money, first of all, it's a pittance; it's hardly anything. And second of all, it was merely a suggestion; it wasn't actually an allotment. So, in terms of what reparation has to be, it has to be a national project because it was America that did this. It wasn't just local communities; it was America. And so, we have to start at the federal level, and we can do local ordinances like um, like we've seen, or we're going to see in Louisville and other places. But we can't allow people to kind of skirt this issue and do articles and say, well, we're doing a great thing. We're doing this thing in Evanston. And when you look at Evanston, it's not reparations. It's just a suggestion. We need real money, real wealth, because wealth was plundered and wealth must be repaid. So talk to me about that, that, that claim right there. Wealth is plundered. Wealth must be replayed. That is the fundamental argument of reparations for most folk, myself included. But a lot of times where we get stuck is the details of what kind of plunder we're talking about, what kind of money it takes to repair the damage done, who gets it, and how they get it. So talk to me a little bit about ADOS's policy vision as it pertains to reparations. Well, ADO, as ADOS, the ADOS Advocacy Foundation, we are committed to cash payments. And we are committed to cash payments to a specific group of people, right? And those are American descendants of slavery. Now, we have a transformative black agenda that includes all black people. But in terms of reparations, those are the people that built the country and have been systemically, methodically oppressed since then. So you have to have a method not only for cash payments, but for programs to protect that wealth. Because you can give wealth to a group of people and then that money is plundered by white supremacy and super capitalists who would like nothing more than to take it away from us. So we have to have certain protections, but we absolutely have to have cash payments. And this absolutely has to be a federal government initiative in terms of how we do this and how we have outlays and appropriations and things of that nature. It has to happen that way. Cash payments, how much are we talking? I like to talk about it as a down payment. I don't like to talk about it because I always say it this way. It takes a lot more time to heal a wound than it takes to inflict a wound. And America has been inflicting a wound for 400 years plus. So it's going to take longer than that to actually heal that wound and close the racial wealth gap, which we like to call the lineage wealth gap. It's going to take longer than that. So I like to call it a down payment. But I think we're talking about at least 20 trillion. That's where we are. Down payment. $20 trillion. So and it's, it's an interesting number when you think about what happened uh, during the pandemic, when, when American capitalism was on the brink, when uh, Trump's presidency was looking shaky, when uh, the heads of multinational corporations were like, what are we going to do? They found a trillion dollars real quick for America, right? So the idea of not being able to recover $20 trillion is somewhat... It, less plausible than it was before because there was time people you almost sounded like dr evil saying any, anything with a t in it right but now that amount of money doesn't sound crazy anymore to people but for the person who asks how do we get that money where does it come from how do you sustain a a, a, a budget how do you sustain an economy while giving 20 trillion dollars to a 13 percent of the people and really less than 13 percent of the people if you're talking about ados lineage right 
Um, how do you do that? How, what do you say to that person? Well, I, I say to everybody, I'm not mandating or demanding that everything happen at one time. I'm not, I'm not demanding that. This is a project. And this is a formidable project. We actually have to have processes in place. So if we want to start the project and say we have two trillion this year and we have one trillion next year and we have three trillion, we can do that. But the problem in America isn't how, because everybody found a way to give Guam reparations, even though it wasn't on the level of ADOS. Everybody found a way to give Japanese Americans reparations, even though it's not on the level of, of American descendants of slavery. The problem that we have is not, is not how do we do this. The problem that we have is people who don't believe that we should do this. And so I'm, I'm more than willing to enter into negotiations and conversations with people who are asking about the how, because the how is something we can figure out. This doesn't have to be, listen, you all, this country did this in a multi-generational way, and we can fix this in a multi-generational way. It doesn't have to all happen today, but it has to happen. And we can enter into that conversation with people of goodwill who want to see this happen. The problem that America has is that a, there are not enough people, and Martin Luther King Jr. said this himself about even liberals who just kind of tolerate us rather than want the best for us or want justice for us. We need to deal with those people and have an honest conversation with them because I can figure out the how. The 20 trillion doesn't have to happen all in 2020, 2021 or 2022 or 2023. We can figure out a process, but it has to happen. And people have to be willing and have the will to do it. One of the things that ADOS gets criticized the most for, and I've been critical of you, and you know this, I've told you directly, is the conversations that often emerge from people who identify as ADOS around nativism, right? There, there, there often becomes a discourse that emerges online from people with the ADOS hashtag. And I'm using that language very carefully because you've said to me before, that ain't us, right? You know, the people may use the hashtag, that don't mean they represent us. But is there, is, is there any room for, for a conversation in your estimation around how ADOS and its sort of commitment to talking about descendants of slavery may alienate people who come from other parts of the continent, may undermine a pan-African agenda, or may kind of replicate, whether it's through the American flag imagery or through con constantly talking about a certain kind of lineage, um, almost replicate a certain kind of American nationalism? Well, you know, I think we have to make a sort of delineation, right? There's a difference between nationalism and nativism. We're proud of the country that we built we're proud of the slaves who built the country. We are absolutely proud of our freedom struggle through Jim Crow, mass incarceration. We're proud that we're still here. So what I would say is we are absolutely have a right to be proud of what we built, right? The same way that a Jamaican American is absolutely proud of the, of, 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 the, of their history of coming out of slavery. The same way a Haitian is absolutely proud of Toussaint La Overture. We're proud in the same way, and you have to let us have that. We are a specific ethnic lineage, that's who we are. Now, there have been a lot of diaspora wars, but let me say this, a lot of those wars were not started by us. And a lot of those wars, we were defending ourselves. People call me the granddaughter of a cotton picker, right? People call me all sorts of names because I come from sharecroppers. And the problem that I have with a lot of Pan-Africanists is that they will look at me and say, oh my gosh, you have people behaving in ways that are unproductive. And I wanna say, you have a lot of people who are behaving in ways that are white supremacists. They are behaving in ways where they co-sign white supremacy. We saw on CNN, somebody say something, an anchor said something about America's the greatest country. I could never have done this in another country. Meanwhile, we as ADAR see this, we see what America has done to us. And we see that a lot of people are not very respectful of not only what we have endured, but the pathway where we have opened up to them to come here. If it wasn't for us and our freedom struggle, there would be no black and brown people here. And so we see a lot of disrespect coming our way. So I think the people who criticize us need to also criticize the people who disparage us as well. I only see criticism coming in our direction, and that's a problem for me. I, I think that's fair. So, so let's, let's stipulate for a minute that there's a lot of outside criticism coming towards you that's unfair. And what do you say, though, about the, the, the criticisms that are being levied towards ADOS for these ideas around sort of being anti-immigrant, sort of dis, not just sort of having critique of pan-Africanism, but almost 
uh, deriding it. I mean, and again, maybe all of this isn't part of the fundamental ideology, but it certainly plays out in the kind of primary space where ADOS conversations are having, which is online, as much of our conversations are for everybody. How do you, how, do, you, do, you do you think that it's gotten unwieldy because it's online and because you can't have hash, you can't control who hashtags it? Do you feel like the, the messaging hasn't been clear or do you think that this is just part and parcel of, of how this kind of politics go? Well, I think there, I think, I think you're, I think you're right on, there have been people who just throw the hashtag in because they want clout. And they do that on Clubhouse, they do that on Twitter, they do it on social media, everywhere. They just want clout. I'm going to say I'm ADOS, but I'm going to bring in some stuff from other people who are not ADOS, and I'm going to just throw it, right, at, at immigrants. I'm going to throw it at black immigrants. I'm going to disparage them. That has happened, but that's not a part of what we're doing in terms of our organization. What we have said is that, listen, we are, we are absolutely interested in organizing with people who are who are black immigrants and people who are black american but come from immigrant backgrounds but we have to organize with a certain kind of foundation right we have to have the same kind of politics i'm not opposed to someone who comes from somewhere else who comes here we have to have the same politics though and i do think on there has been disparaging right on both sides but what we're trying to do in terms of the ADOS Advocacy Foundation has moved to a place to where if you have our politics, we have a lot in terms of our agenda for anti-discrimination, right? So if you are a black person in America, you still benefit from our agenda. So like-minded people, we would like to pull in here. We do have a critique of Pan-Africanism. And we say that like in terms of, and I think it was Nikki Giovanni who said something similar, everybody has to be responsible for their corner of the world. And in this corner, ADOS is most responsible. And we will support you with whatever you want to do in Ghana, whatever you want to do in Nigeria. But we have to be responsible with what happened here because I feel like Pan-Africanism has been like a feel-good kind of opium for black people that has not netted anything in terms of real political advancement. And so I think we should all, and I'm not talking just about ADOS, I think all black people should look locally, look to your, your, to your state government, your, your sovereign nation in terms of where your advocacy begins. Because if you can't get reparations and voting rights in America, I know doggone well you're not going to get police reform in Nigeria. <laughs> All right, I gotta go, but I want to bring you back because we we I want to really unpack this conversation about Pan Africanism because that's probably where you and I are gonna separate just, just a little bit among other things. So make sure you come back. Hopefully, Tone can make it as well, and we can continue to have this conversation about reparations. And our commitment here at Black News tonight is to talk about reparations from a variety of voices. We are not going and and we did this one time. And we ain't gonna do it again. I'm not gonna have people here who oppose reparations instead because I don't want to normalize that idea when most Black people support reparations. Instead, what we want to do is have multiple voices from the reparations community to talk about various ways that we can achieve the end of getting black folk what they deserve, which is reparations. Yvette Carnell, thank you so much for joining me. Everybody, stay with me. we got much more coming up on Black News tonight.